Hello, this is Aaron, and welcome back to the podcast. I had promised in the newsletter that I was going to give a little bit of an explanation of this emerging split between conservatives, Republicans, and big business by talking a bit about chambers of commerce and what they are. A lot of conservative or Republican dissidents like to criticize the Chamber of Commerce. And when they do that, they're typically talking about the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C. But there are many other kinds of chambers of commerce out there. So I wanted to give a little bit of a primer on what a chamber is, the different kinds of them, and a little bit about the dynamics that shape each type. As it happened, I recently spent a year doing consulting work for the local Metro Chamber of Commerce here in Indianapolis, the Indy Chamber. So I have a bit of an inside view on that. Now, if you want to say, Aaron, you're biased because you worked on the inside, uh, that's fair. But hopefully you will find this educational uh, regardless. But first, something a little different. In the month of February, I am going to have a sponsor for the podcast and the, the newsletter that sponsor is going to be Gold River Trading Company Tees. Now, for those of you who listen to John Harris and his Conversations That Matter podcast, you've probably already heard about Gold River. But for those of you who don't, uh, let me give you a little background. I work part-time for a company called New Founding Corporation. And at New Founding, we are looking to find and promote as well as create pro-American companies that have quality products and services. We want to build companies that love our country and love our people, who love all of our people, not just the ones who are on board with the latest secular elite project. Right? We want companies that not only have great products and services, but aren't going to turn on and attack their own customers to earn the praise of the New York Times, which so many businesses uh, do today. Look at NASCAR, for example. What an embarrassment uh, they are. And so Gold River Trading Company is one of our brands. Uh, Gold River produces a variety of high-quality teas in teabag form in quite nicely designed packaging. So if you're on to YouTube, uh, I'm holding up a tin of our uh, peppermint green tea, which is very good. Give you a sense of what the packaging looks like. Gold River is the official tea of the American frontier, which is very appropriate. America has always been a frontier country, and we're on the frontier today, especially those of us who are on this podcast. We are the people who are exploring, figuring out how to live, and settling this new and radically different world in which we find ourselves. So it's very appropriate that we would drink tea that honors the frontier. Now, I will admit to being mostly a coffee drinker, but every year, uh, I just as I do a dry January and don't drink during the month of January, yes, I'm a fashion victim. I, I'm doing what lots of other people are doing. In fact, uh, wrapping that up today. But also during the year, I take fast from coffee. I don't drink coffee, and so I drink tea. So yes, I am a legitimate tea drinker, and pretty soon now I'm going to be drinking a large amount of Gold River Trading Company coffee personally. So check us out. It's at goldriverco.com. That's goldriverco.com. There's a lot of different kinds of tea out there. There's the peppermint green I just showed you. Uh, there's an Earl Grey. There's other green and black teas. There's a chamomile herbal tea. Uh, if you really like cinnamon, there's a cinnamon hot chocolate that's like great for the winter. There's still time to uh, order that because it's cold. So again, check it out today. And there's discount code REN10 to get you 10% off your order. That's R-E-N-N-1-0 will get you 10% off your order. So REN10, get it? Easy to remember. I wanted to do REN1010, but that would be 100% off, and uh, nobody can afford to give away those kinds of discounts. So visit it today, goldriverco.com. Use discount code REN10 for 10% off, and 50 orders of $50 or more get free shipping. Now on to the Chambers of Commerce. First off, what is a Chamber of Commerce? Basically, a Chamber of Commerce is a membership-based business association. So what that means is it's an organization created by a group of businesses that come together for mutual benefit. And typically, Chambers represent a rather broad-based 
business constituency, not just a specific industry. So they tend to represent a group of businesses uh, that are more diverse. And I'll give you the types in, in a minute. But some of the mutual aid activities that are undertaken by a chamber include one is mutual and mutual support uh, and uh, support activities themselves. The second is civic development activities. And the third is lobbying. So what are some examples of these sort of mutual aid and support things? It could be making introductions. So being able to facilitate introductions to other members. It could be training opportunities. It could be networking events. It could be discounts. One of the things that you get if you're a member of the Indy Chamber is a discount on health insurance for your employees uh, with Anthem Insurance, which is one of the biggest insurance here in town. So you get special deals for being part of that. There are a lot of events that bring people together. So the idea is how do we all boost each other's business, open doors for one another, provide tangible benefits to each other, and uh, things of that nature. Civic improvement initiatives are just what they are. Those are things that are designed to improve the community, often economic uh, development in nature. So you could have things like beautification and those light pole banners uh, that you see in neighborhoods. Uh, for example, a lot of neighborhood chambers of commerce do that. Uh, a lot of neighborhood chambers of commerce will even run a, what's called a business improvement district or a bid. And a bid is essentially a special taxing district in a sort of commercial area where property owners uh, voluntarily vote to create a taxing district and pay just a little bit more in taxes every year. And that tax goes into a nonprofit, often administered by the Chamber of Commerce, called a bid. And they do things like fund people to pick up trash in the streets, to empty trash cans, to put on events. Uh, that draw people into the area, those sorts of things. Uh, so that's like a, a small scale one. Another one is that chambers of commerce often run economic developments for cities or even entire regions. They are essentially the economic development agency under contract to other people. And they might also lead, essentially be the lead organization in a community trying to promote some sort of civic improvement initiative. So here in Indianapolis, the local chamber of commerce uh, took the lead on really trying to uh, drive to completion a, an expansion of the local transit system here. We had basically the worst transit system of any major big city in America. So the chamber said, let's mobilize the community, go to work at the state house to try to improve public transit. And yes, there's a business angle to that in a lot of cases. You know, the more prosperous the community is, the more prosperous the business community is. Uh, the, the better you have a public transit system, uh, the easier it is for uh, potential workers in a constrained environment to get to a job at one of these places it needs to hire or to, to be able to shop at a particular business. So I'm not going to say that all of these activities are totally selfless. It's an attempt to, uh, to do well by doing good, uh, but they are more community oriented and less directly oriented towards uh, kind of the, the bespoke or, or parochial needs of the actual businesses who are members. And then the third thing is lobbying, uh, which I hope is self-explanatory. They will lobby state or federal or local governments to carry out the priorities of the business community. They're, they're very big into lobbying. So not all kinds of chambers do all kinds of activities. And I basically divide the chamber landscape into four different kinds. So the first is the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. And this is what most people think about when they think of a Chamber of Commerce. Now, the U.S. Chamber is essentially a big business organization in D.C., almost exclusively large Fortune 500 type companies. If you've been to D.C. and seen the Chamber of Commerce building, it is a gigantic neoclassical structure that looks like a government building. And that's what they want you to think of them as. They want you to think of American business as a branch of the government. A lot of people in D.C. try to put very impressive buildings uh, on display to flaunt their power, et cetera. And the chamber really does this extraordinarily well because, again, it looks like a federal building. Uh, if this building were located in your city, you would think that was the federal courthouse. That's sort of the building that it looks like. Now, the U.S. Chamber is not the only sort of big business club in D.C. The Business Roundtable is essentially a competitor, if you want to call it that. And I don't pretend to know all the aspects of the U.S. Chamber. 
Uh, they've kind of been in trouble lately. You can Google for them in the Wall Street Journal. A lot of businesses uh, are not entirely happy with them. There's kind of been a little bit of scandals. And I think the key with the U.S. Chamber, though, is they represent the interest of big business constituencies, and they are almost exclusively a lobbying shop, so far as I know. Yes, they have a foundation that does a little bit of research and things like that, but that's much more of like an, an appendix, uh, you know, on the end. It's not really the main function. They are first and foremost about wielding corporate clout on Capitol Hill. And so naturally, people who are more skeptical of big business really set their sights on the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But there are other kinds of chambers as well. There are also state chambers of commerce. There are city or metro chambers of commerce. And there are local or neighborhood chambers of commerce. And then there are affinity group chambers of commerce, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, for example, is an example of an affinity group uh, chamber of commerce. I'm not going to talk too much about affinity group chambers of commerce because they basically represent or replicate the same functions as regular chambers of commerce I'm going to talk about, but just for their affinity group. So I already talked about the U.S. Chamber. State chambers um, are also somewhat similar to the U.S. Chamber in the sense that they support traditional Reaganomics. If you're looking for somebody who's going to support sort of a tax cut, regulatory cut agenda, uh, less government in a state that's a big, powerful lobby, it's probably your state chamber that's going to do that. Uh, they tend to, you know, be you know dominated by kind of uh, incumbent employers, and they're looking for things that you know make sure that they don't have a lot of regulations, that they have a sufficient labor force, etc. So this is kind of state chambers that are very powerful uh, in in states. And they essentially take the traditional conservative line. These are people you would think of as Chamber of Commerce Republicans for the most part. City or metro chambers uh, are very different. Uh, they are uh, often quite large uh, uh, and have a lot of big corporations in them, but they tend to be much more progressive. These chambers of commerce represent, in essence, the woke capital line. And you know, they're, they're not totally, you know, sold on defund the police or things like that or some of those agendas. Uh, but they're, again, you know, I mentioned public transit. They're very much on the pro-public transit agenda. And I think you would find them very aligned with essentially the progressive uh, consensus on issues. And so they have a lot of big businesses and Fortune 500 companies that are very uh, influential in these organizations. And so they're definitely more progressive leaning. So what you see often, not constantly, is that the state chamber and the city or regional chamber of like the big city in the state don't always agree. Sometimes they're at odds and uh, may actually be lobbying at cross purposes in the legislature, depending on what the issue is. Now, they may line up together on other issues, but they might be at cross purposes on, on some. And I think it's interesting that these are you know, very distinct in their approaches. And this, I think, this is true of most states, even though there's heavily overlapping membership, particularly among the big companies there. The city or um, regional chambers are also the ones that do by far the most civic development work. They're one of the main civic development uh, institutions in the state. So, for example, here in Indianapolis, the local chamber is the Regional Economic Development Organization. So, in other words, they're basically responsible for marketing this region to the country for business expansion relocation, talent attraction, all of those things. So most regions have a regional economic development organization or RIDO, and they do things like respond to inquiries from site selectors. So there might be a, uh, you know, a, a consulting firm that's representing a manufacturer who wants to expand and they'll make inquiries, you know, can you send me data about this, data about that? And so they respond and deliver them all the data. The uh, again, the Indy Chamber is also the local economic development organization or LIDO for the city of Indianapolis. And on the local economic development side, rather than more of a marketing function, uh, a lot of it is around administering tax incentives on behalf of the local government. So they uh, manage all the process of delivering local incentives to businesses that are looking to relocate in the city of Indianapolis, actually in the county, Marion County, but we have a, a merged city county government here. And, you know, again, they do tons of other stuff. Uh, the Indy Chamber uh, was also essentially a bank. It was a community development financial institution, or CDFI. It's really not technically a bank, but it's sort of the same thing. It has money and it makes loans. 
And one of the things we did during the pandemic was make loans to small businesses to help keep them afloat, both administering PPP loans and other types of term loans. And I think the key with a lot of these civic development activities is they, they fall into the spaces where the existing membership uh, of the uh, chamber is not already playing from a commercial perspective. So obviously, you know, a chamber that has a financing arm is not going to compete with the banks <laughs> because the banks are, the, are basically the members and the big funders. But again, the key is to tell you these people do a whole lot of civic development work and even operate sort of quasi-governmental functions or you know, even directly governmental functions under contract. It's very common for chambers to run economic development. So that's that's an element of, of local chamber. Another thing about the kind of the, the regional slash city chambers is they have a component that is a broad-based business component, uh, which could include small businesses. You know, the, how many small businesses and how small the businesses varies from place to place. And they've also got big corporations. And there's usually a, a corporate council or a corporate club for just the big companies uh, in a region as well. And this can be essentially an inner club or an inner ring uh, inside of the chamber, or it can be a separate organization. So here in Indianapolis, uh, the corporate council is a separate organization called the Central Indiana Corporate Partnership, which represents the 60 biggest businesses and universities uh, in the region. And then the chamber, which has all those other uh, entities as members as well, is much more broad based and has uh, um, local government. So the big corporations generally have their own group, as well as being part of the regular chamber and, you, you know, which is done by what varies from place to place. Uh, but there's always those. So, for example, in Chicago, again, I'm, I'm not quite as up on how it's structured today. The Chicago Land Chamber of Commerce basically ran uh, with the regular chamber functions. And there was a group called the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago that was sort of the main civic group run by the biggest of businesses uh, in, in the city. So they had their own separation in that way. And this is, again, very common. There's a sort of a division of labor there. And so that's what I see. So what I would say is uh, when I look at these metro chambers, uh, if you're a conservative, especially if you're a social conservative, you're probably not going to like these people because they represent the woke agenda. But a lot of them really are pretty good in terms of institutions. So I use this formula to talk about what is like, how do you respond to institutional decline? How do you manage for institutional uh uh, credibility over the longer term in an era when we're losing trust in institutions. And I laid it out. I said, you want to have institutions that operate with high degrees of trustworthiness and personal integrity in their leaderships. It's just baseline ethics, the kinds of people that you feel like if you give them money, they're going to steward it well. They're not going to steal it. They're going to deal with things properly. Trustworthiness. Secondly is competence. Are they any good at what they do? <laughs> right? are, they, are they any good at it? Can they actually execute? We just saw a bridge collapse in Pittsburgh, and we've seen all kinds of indications in our economy. We just don't have very competent institutions. We don't have competent public health institutions, uh, for example. So competence is important. And then the last is what I call missional integrity. People who are staying on the mission of the organization and not deforming under the pressure to essentially politicize things or to have little groups come in and redirect the organization to their principal. So what I'd say is a lot of chambers of commerce basically satisfy that at sort of the city regional level. They tend to, you know, manage money well and be ethical. They tend to be pretty competent at what they do. I mean, in fact, one reason governments outsource to them is because they're better at executing than government. And they tend to be pretty focused on their mission. It just so happens that some of their mission is very kind of woke capital stuff. So uh, although I think it's, you know, there, there are sort of a lot of things that, um, you know, a lot of conservatives wouldn't agree with in these organizations. Uh, there are certainly uh, have a lot of good qualities um, as well. And, you know, I criticize uh, Republicans, in including here in Indiana, for kowtowing to business or certainly the worst kinds of businesses. Uh, as I, I like to say, if you didn't read it, I have this article in American Affairs about Indiana under Republican rule. And I'll actually probably try to put a link to it in the show notes so you know you can check it out if you haven't read it already 
And I criticized, you know, a lot of the decisions that the state of Indiana had made in terms of kowtowing to abusive industries. These sorts of moves by states are typically not the result of lobbying by chambers of commerce. They're typically a result of industry vertical lobbying groups that really are essentially the special interest clubs. These are the kinds of people who in D.C., you'd say, are down on K Street. Like, and you would just, let's just use an example. The pharmaceutical industry comes together. They have their lobbyists individually and collectively, and they're pushing pharmaceutical legislation that's favorable to their industry on Capitol Hill. Those kinds of bespoke industry lobbies are very different from chambers of commerce. And these tend to be the ones that are the most mercenary and in many ways the most toxic. So the third largest lobbying organization in the state of Indiana is the nursing home industry, which if you read my article, you would say we have an incredibly dangerous nursing home industry that is in effect a gigantic financial fraud. Or you can think about the casino industry. I talked about casinos and uh, all of that. So, you know, that's the casino lobby. You know, that's not, that's not typically the chamber of commerce uh, that do those things. In fact, some of the things that I said you should do, the state of Indiana should do, like pregnancy accommodations law, actually, I took it right out of the Indy Chamber's legislative agenda. Now, certainly, I would not rep everything uh, in that agenda. Uh, there's things in there that I certainly would oppose. There's things that are just clearly outside of their lane as a business organization, uh, in, in my opinion, like pushing for unlimited mail-in voting. I'm just like, what is this doing? Uh, you know, in a Chamber of Commerce agenda, it seems pr pretty far afield from that. But nevertheless, I mean, I thought there was some very good stuff in there. Uh, and I would say uh, uh, more often than not, um, you know, they're, they're kind of stopping some crazy things uh, much more than, um, you know, maybe pushing their own agenda in some cases. And so when and I think, do you think at the national level, you have to give a good look at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and business roundtables and these groups at the state level and the local level, where you really need to look is these industry-specific lobbies, the apartment lobby, uh, the, you know, the slumlord lobby here in Indiana, very po powerful. Uh, they represent these industries, and they tend to get a lot of what they want in their industries. And this sort of, these sort of special industry, special interest groups really own red states lock, stock, and barrel. And whenever a red state starts talking about limited government, you can almost always be sure that what they're talking about is a giveaway to one of these special interest lobbies, okay? So these are the guys I think you'd work out much more so than uh, chambers of commerce with, again, the exception of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Chambers of Commerce tend to be broader-based business associations. And, you know, business is a legitimate stakeholder in a community. They do need to be represented. They shouldn't have too much power. Uh, but, you know, they deserve a legitimate seat at the table. So those are... Uh, those are the national, the state, and the local, uh, and the regional city chambers. And then the local chamber of commerce tends to be much more focused on sort of mainstream issues around uh, attracting shoppers to a neighborhood commercial district. So there will be, you know, the Lincoln Park Chamber of Commerce in Chicago or the, you know, the, the West Lakeview Chamber of Commerce or whatever. And their whole point is, how do we lure more people to our community? So they may throw a festival, street festival or something, which brings people in and, of course, raises money for them. Again, they will do the banners. They'll put out the trash cans. They'll do beautification. They'll do marketing. They'll create nice little maps. You know, these these are people that tend to be there. So don't let your little neighborhood co uh, chamber get tarred with the brush that comes from the national chamber. And what I would say is all chambers of commerce hate social conservative policies. They hate them. They think that they're bad for business. You know what? They're probably right about that, to be quite honest. In this environment, it is kind of bad for business. And what I say is it's not as bad for business as people claim it is. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, all these companies like to threaten people. We're not going to invest. In, but the analogy I use is you always hear about these people say, oh, I don't want to go downtown because there's no parking or parking's too expensive. A actually, the real problem is there's nothing down there you want. If you really wanted something, you'd pay to park downtown. And it's the same thing with these, these companies. Oh, your social policies are terrible, so we're not going to invest here. If they really are not investing, it's not because of your social conservative policies. It's because you don't have anything that they want. Go down to Texas. They just passed this abortion law uh, that's you know pretty strict, and the Supreme Court's letting it go in effect. And you hear all these people, oh, we're not moving to Texas. We're not moving to Texas. We well, you know what? What happened? I just saw that Facebook, Meta, or whatever they're called now, 
just going to open a big office in Austin. They're going to expand big time in Austin. You know, this abortion law meant nothing to them because the workforce and the other things that they want is in Texas. And so they're going to come there to get what's good for their business there. Now, do I believe there's, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, there can't be any consequences. Of course, there could be things at the margin. Georgia, I think, lost the all-star game on account of some voting integrity law. Uh, so there could be there should could be some some challenges. But for the most part, uh, I think the realities of people saying, oh, I won't move here, talent won't move here because their policies are so backwards, it's just not true, vastly, vastly, vastly exaggerated. But what it does what it does create, what social conservative laws do create is lots of bad publicity. And if there's anything that businesses hate, it's bad publicity. Uh, they hate bad publicity about themselves, and they hate bad publicity about where they're at. So all they want to do is just say, can't we squelch and suppress all of that stuff? And, uh, you know, let's just talk about low taxes and low regulation. Or on the case of, you know, the, the more progressive city urban chambers, some of this more progressive signaling so that we can show you know, the rest of the country, how progressive we are, even if you're not actually all that progressive because you're, you know, in you know, some Rust Belt state like Michigan. But anyhow, that's just a little bit of, um, of there. Um, I do think there's reason to dislike the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. I do think that if you're a social conservative, um, you know, you are going to find yourself in opposition to your local Chamber of Commerce, uh, or excuse me, your state chamber probably, but especially your metro chamber. They're probably going to be advancing uh, agendas that you don't like, but don't let them let that turn you against, you know, your local chamber of commerce just trying to promote the local restaurants and stuff in the in the neighborhood where you live. And again, keep in mind that a lot of these organizations actually do do some useful things uh, as well. So try to put it in perspective. And again, thank you very much, and I'll talk to you next week.